7, found on page 126. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, Thus shall you bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So shall they invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. This too is the word of the Lord. We pray that you would burn this scripture into our hearts and our minds and to the deepest recesses of our soul. Uh, we thank you for it, and we pray that you would speak to each of our hearts, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, folks, every culture seems to have a prayer of blessing, right? We've seen plaques with an Irish blessing, and we've seen plaques with an English blessing, and we've seen plaques with a German blessing, and there are French and Italian blessings with you know plaques, and you've got Chinese and Japanese blessings, and you've got Native American blessings, and I think you actually have a blessing for every Native American tribe. And so as many languages and many cultures throughout the world, you have a blessing for everything. Right? And yet, that being said, give me the Jewish blessing in Numbers chapter 6. Give me the believer's blessing that comes from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so to me, and I trust to you, to the believer, that's the only blessing that really ever matters, right? It's a blessing that comes from God to his people. And it's God's way of saying, I give myself to you in every and all circumstances. Every and all circumstances, I give myself to you. That's what, he, what a wonderful thought and truth. I, I want to place this um, prayer uh, in context here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is, so obviously it's in the book of Numbers, and what you want to know about the book of Numbers, the theme of that book is that God is in the midst of his people. He encamps among his people. His presence is with his people. And when you come over to chapters 5 and 6, those chapters are about sanctification, that is purifying his people, and it's about separation. It's about separating them unto himself from the world. It's a, because we're a redeemed people, right? And I want you to notice that even though chapter 6 is about the Nazarite vow, now a Nazarite vow would be something that somebody could take, but not everybody had to take a Nazarite vow. It was voluntary. You could take it. Sometimes God placed that upon a particular servant, like, for example, Samson, you see. But this is a blessing here that follows after chapters 5 and 6. Despite the Nazarite vow, it's a blessing for all the people. It's just not a limited blessing. And the other thing I want you to notice, and it's not going to be brought out here in the text, but this prayer was said every morning after the daily morning sacrifice. Now, God had required back in Exodus that the nation was required to sacrifice a lamb in the morning and in the evening every single day according to how he prescribed it. And after the sacrifice of that lamb, this blessing would be pronounced upon the nation, his people. 
Now, there were other sacrifices that took place. You know, for example, if you lived during that time and maybe you wanted to offer a peace offering to the Lord, you would bring the appropriate offering or other people would do that. So it wasn't the only sacrifice, but it was the one of the required sacrifices. And it's significant that it's uttered after this prayer is uttered after the sacrifice that morning. Now, this is also known as Aaron's blessing or the Aaronic blessing. And this is important. The priests, on behalf of the Lord, had the authority to pronounce that blessing upon God's people. As a minister of the gospel, I can pronounce this blessing upon you as I speak this morning based on the authority of God and Holy Scripture. This is a blessing to God, his people. And the, and the priests, that was part of their duty, was to pronounce this blessing. And notice it, it comes with some wonderful promises, but, but it was a collective blessing, and it was a blessing of graduation. That is to say, you know, when you go to, you go to high school, you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, junior, senior, then you graduate. And so what you do is you go from one grade to the next. Right? And so the blessing of graduation here, it's, the whole prayer is like a crescendo. And it builds off of one line a after the other. And now, I want you to notice that there are six parts to this blessing, and they're coupled. They're kind of, you know, Siamese twins. They're linked. You have bless and keep. You have shine and gracious. You have countenance and peace. And so they play off of one another. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, prayer. And, and if you notice, the movement is of God moving toward his people. And it highlights his activity among his people. Furthermore, notice that it's a triple blessing. The Lord bless you. The Lord make his face. The Lord lift up his countenance. Now, that name, and we talked about this the other week, but the Lord, that name is Yahweh, and they typically didn't pronounce that. But remember I said to you that in, in Exodus chapter 6, Moses, God said to Moses, I did not make my name fully known to Abraham and Jacob, but I'm making it fully known to you. And so it's I am who I am. And so it's God in covenant with his people. Now, as an interesting side note, Jewish interpreters could never figure out this triple blessing. They saw it as a mystery. And yet, when we come to the New Testament, maybe perhaps it's just simply pointing to the blessed trinity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Also, I want you to keep in mind that when these blessings were uttered, they're wandering in the wilderness. And you talk about a hostile environment. You talk about an environment of uncertainty. And so that's the context of all of these blessings. And so the essence of the prayer is this, is that the people of God are a very, very blessed people because he's given himself to every situation. He's initiated this relationship that we have with him. He's promised to bless the relationship that we have with him. And he promises to preserve the relationship that we have with him. That's a wonderful, wonderful, prom they're wonderful promises. And so the, the, the commitment here and the prayer is actually expressing security, prosperity, and general well-being. That, the general well-being is expressed through uh, and give you peace. You know, peace is, peace is not only the opposite of war. It's much, much more than that. It's a state of wholeness, emotionally and spiritually and mentally and physically. And it's a state of completeness, and, it, and it's all-encompassing of, of being safe and secure in the relationship with God. And then finally, I want you to notice that the prayer closes with emphasis I will bless them. <clears throat> you don't have to do anything to earn the blessing of God, as, 
as, as a, the people of God. Remember, you go back to Genesis. What did God say to Abraham? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Is that seven I wills? He said seven I wills. Abraham didn't have to. He just simply believed. And so, so folks, what I see here is this, this blessing comes under the law after the morning daily sacrifice. But what's its ultimate intention? You know that all sacrifices pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that the law is a tutor to bring people to Christ. So ultimately, this whole blessing points to Christ and his cross. Because that's how he forms the relationship ultimately. You know, some, some want to take this blessing and they want to make it all about the earthly provision. God's going to be here when you're, you're hungry and you're needy and you're this. True. But the spiritual always governs the physical, and the spiritual is always higher than the physical. And so this is ultimately about spiritual provision. Now, did the Jewish people fully understand that back then? Probably not. If you go over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, we're told that the prophets sought to know what person, that is, who's the Messiah, they sought to know his timing, like when is he going to arrive on the scene, and they kind of fumbled and bumbled, or, what's his sufferings, what is his sufferings all about? And so those, that was always obscure, but the prophets were always searching because the scripture says the Spirit of Christ pointed them to all those things. You come over to Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant, even to this day, Jewish people, Jewish interpreters, don't always see that pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. That veil is still over their eyes, you see? That, that shroud, they can't, you know, people just can't find their way through it. But Isaiah 53 touches on his sufferings too. As a guilt offering, he's going to be a guilt offering. And so they never saw that God himself would be the sacrificial lamb to make all these blessings possible. You see, you and I, we can read Aaron's blessing here, and we can read it in the shadow of the cross, and we can see that the blessings of God have extended outward for centuries and come down through the ages because of the cross of Christ. And we know this based on Romans chapter 3, verse 26, because God tells us in the Old Testament, he looked forward to the cross, and in the New Testament, he still looks back to the cross. And so the cross is very, very central in God's eyes. And so it's, it's God through the power of the cross that makes this relationship possible and comes out of this blessing upon his people. Uh, through the cross, he justifies and he sanctifies and he redeems and he glorifies. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, to those who are being saved by it, the cross, it is the power of God unto salvation. You know, all those, I've said this before, all those smart people who sit in Washington, who sit around in the halls of Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Columbia, they know nothing. They know nothing of the wisdom of God. Nothing. In 1 Peter, Peter spoke of God's people being a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Right? Right? called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so, you probably know that Scripture teaches that we're all believer priests. You see, this is why we can come before the throne of grace. You don't have to be in church to do that. You can sit on your couch and do that. But you have direct access to God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, you're a believer priest. And that is accomplished through the power of the cross. You don't become a believer priest except through the power of the cross. Now, what I, what I want to do is I, I want to quickly move through the various aspects of this prayer, and I ultimately want to point to Christ's Calvary 
at uh, sacrifice at Calvary. So the Lord bless you here really speaks to having a relationship with the Lord. And God's intended goal was always to have a relationship for his, with, with the people for his own possession. And you know, I think most of you know the scripture, that Christ was slain from the foundation of the world to make that relationship possible. And so the blessings that come from Calvary are legion. I mean, how do you count all of those blessings? But it really ultimately starts with a relationship. You know, when you have a relationship with God, then you have the promise for provision, and you have the promise for being kept, and you have the promise for all of those other blessings that he might send our way. But it starts with relationship. Uh, the word in the Hebrew here, to bless, implies a salutation or a greeting, like these uh, today we would say, hi, hello, how are you, right? But in this particular culture, a salutation or a greeting was because you were, it was about relationship and it was about friendship. And that's, that's what the word to bless points to. This is the same word, folks, that God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, I will bless you. The seven I wills, I will bless you, I will bless you. I will do this. And so what, what emerges from Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis chapter 24 is this very special relationship that God and Abraham have together. Uh, James talks about Abraham being a friend of God and that relationship produces a friendship and that friendship produces a fellowship and that fellowship points to a partnership in covenant. It's a very, very special bond and relationship. And so out of this covenant relationship, you know, Yahweh promises you know, to keep his people. Uh, to keep here uh, carries with it the idea of what a shepherd does, watches, preserves, and guards the sheep. It, it's, a, it's a word for safekeeping. If you find yourself between the rock and the hard place, God still has you there for safekeeping. That's the intent of this. Uh, in Psalm 121, it, you know, it talks about how God keeps his people, right? Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father give to me, not some, but all that the Father give to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. What a tremendous promise. That's for safekeeping. That's the promise of safekeeping. Also in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, Peter speaks about the church being protected by the power of God for so great a salvation to be revealed in the end time. And so that Hebrew word and that Greek word mean the exact same thing, to watch, to guard, to keep, to protect. What a shepherd does to the sheep. Uh, it actually can mean too, like a sentinel, how he, a sentinel keeps guard and keeps watch. And so it's not only about a relationship, but it's about what God has done in this relationship. You know, you can have a relationship with somebody, but you know, they never seem to do anything. That, you know, you're the initial, you know, you, and you do it all. That's not really a relationship. That might be an acquaintance, maybe. But we're talking about a relationship where God initiates and then he does it all and he expects some sort of response from it. The second coupled part of this blessing here, so with the first, the first one is the Lord bless you and keep you. The second part is the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Folks, this is God's salvation promises that are highlighted here. God's face and grace are upon our relationship with him. What does that mean? Well, face points to several aspects of relationship. For example, first, it's God's presence. If you behold somebody's face, 
you behold the presence of that person's face. They're right before you. So that's the first thing. It's God's presence in the relationship. Uh, what did Jesus say to believers? Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Face also points to the disposition and mood of a person. If I'm like that, if I put on a frown, then that doesn't present a very good, very good disposition or mood that I'm in. But if I have a smile, then that's a different take, right? And so face points to disposition and mood, and to have God's face shine upon his people, it indicates favor, and it indicates blessing. Also, uh, grace communicates that mercy is shown. What a wonderful, wonderful uh, blessing here. Uh, for example, remember in the book of Esther, as a queen, she gets the hearing of the king because her people are in trouble. The Jews are in trouble, and Haman is trying to exterminate them. And so she comes before the king, and she gets the king's face regarding this matter. And he says, Esther, what do you want me to do for you? And so she, she says, protect my people. And so it led to the preservation of God's people and the hanging of Haman. See, God keeps and blesses. In Nehemiah, as cupbearer to the king, remember he was burdened, his heart was sad and heavy, and he goes, he prays and he goes to the king, and he gets the face of the king, and the king says, Nehemiah, what do you want? He says, I want to go back to Jerusalem. He says, yeah, go ahead. No problem. You see? And so they had the favor and the grace and the blessing of the king. And so Aaron's blessing here means that God's people have his face. Uh, conversely, if God were to hide his face, that wouldn't be a good thing. Remember in the movie The Godfather? You know, Michael Corleone, he doesn't want to see Fredo because Fredo went against the family. Fredo was his brother. And he refused to see his brother for months and months and months. And then finally when he saw him, you know, he hugged him and kissed him and then he had him executed. Right? So to hide your face is not a good thing, you see? And to have a frown on your face is not a good thing. But when you have a smile and you have, well, open arms and you have the attention of the king, that's a very, very good thing. So from a New Testament perspective, the power of the cross brings all of this wonder, this brings all these things into wonderful relationship with God our Savior. Grace and mercy and peace, and we find favor with God. Life and light and truth, because his countenance is upon us. And he brings all of these things into proper relationship. The third coupling here of his countenance being lifted up and his peace being upon us. This is, this is actually an extension and an outgrowth of the second coupling here that we talked about. The second coupling, meaning his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. This builds off of that concept here. And it's another way of saying that God is attentive to all of our needs. When somebody, remember when you were a kid, you know, mom or dad might have had their face in a book or something, they're doing something, and all of a sudden you come and you say, mom, mom, dad, dad, and they look up. You have their face, you see? And so this is a way of saying that God is attentive to the needs of his people, and he's responsive to the needs of his people, and he hears the needs of his people. We've, he's, we've, we've got his attention. You know, I, I have to uh, appeal to the earthly parental instincts here this morning. For those of us who are parents, right? It's about being there for your children. Marie, you always said cradle to the grave, right? It doesn't matter how old they are, you know? I don't care if they're 45, 35, or 2. As a parent, you love and you are always concerned about your kids. 
and you want to know what's going on, and you're concerned about their well-being. Amen? That's what's being brought out here. God is very responsive to his children. Uh, you know that the New Testament here speaks of Christ as our peace, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Listen to what someone uh, so eloquently uh, said. In Jesus, the full meaning of peace is revealed. He gave peace, he made peace, and he is our peace. What a wonderful, wonderful thought. And so, when you look at this prayer, you want to look at it as God blanketing his people with himself and all of the blessings of heaven. You know that he's given us all the blessings in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're seated there in the heavenly blessings in Christ. And if he gave us Christ, he can give us more, right? No. If he gave us Christ, he's given us everything. He can't give us any more than Christ, because Christ is everything. He's our all in all. He's the everything that we have. So, in closing, the, the question is this. What, what is our response and commitment to this blessing? See, because the placement of this blessing, scholars look at this and they say, this is kind of like a weird place. Like, Somebody said, why wasn't it placed after Numbers chapter 3? It's because the Holy Spirit wanted it placed here. <laughs> That's why. All right? But they, they look at this and they say, why was it placed here? Remember, it's after the sanctification and the separation. God has made a commitment. And so now, he's looking for a response from that commitment. For, for, because of a redeemed people. Uh, and I think that that's what we have to search our souls here about this morning. God has given us everything. What is our commitment and our response to all of it? And that's something, you know, uh, and I said this, you know, you give up something, you know, from your heart, and you think that you've given it all up. And then God comes knocking a little bit later and says, I want a little bit more. And he's like, ah. And then, you know, you kind of ignore him for a little bit. And he's like, I want a little bit more, you see. And you ignore him even longer. And he comes back and he's like, hello, I want more. Right? That how, that's how it works. Remember, you're raising your kids, right? Mom and dad knock, hey, I want a little more, you see. I mentioned at the outset of this message, give me this blessing, give me Aaron's blessing, give me the blessings of God to his people. I don't care about the Irish blessing, the German blessing, the Italian blessing, the Native American, I don't care about all those blessings. I want Aaron's blessing. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful passage of scripture and thank you uh, that you have sent the Lord Jesus Christ to complete this wonderful relationship uh, on the cross Jesus said it is finished uh, it's a finished work it's a completed work and even though you're still working uh, in and through us you promise to complete this work to the day of Christ Jesus uh, we bless you for this wonderful relationship and we thank you that we have a Heavenly Father who always attends to our needs, who is always concerned. He never slumbers nor sleeps. He, he constantly keeps watch over his people. He never tires. Uh, he never fades away. And we, we, we bless you for that, Lord. And we thank you for the wonderful, wonderful promises of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, as we Transition to communion, Father, uh, we pray that uh, we would find it within our hearts to make uh, a greater commitment and give you more of our hearts, and we thank you for the wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, we, won't, we won't be sorry. 
when we give you more of our hearts. And I, I know that personally, and I think your people know that too. And so uh, bless us as we enter into communion and uh, fill our hearts uh, with all the good things of God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.